For this week's video, I would like to go through another custom layout design project. This time it is for a customer in Thailand. And it was more than a year ago that I received this commission and was working on this design. And I've hesitated to make this video, mainly because the finished result did not go quite as planned. I will get to that later. But I've now decided to make this video anyway, because I, I think it still shows a lot of useful design ideas. So hopefully there is still some value in it for some of my viewers. Here is the space I had to work with. As we can see, it is certainly not an easy space to draw or to use. There isn't a square corner or a parallel line in it anywhere. Partially off the top of the screen was an irregular octagonal building that had been present for a while. And the client was adding a really odd shaped addition. I don't recall what the overall dimensions were, but they were given to me in millimeters. But once everything was drawn up accurately and approved as being correct, then I just allowed Third Planet to convert to feet and inches and work in Imperial, as I normally do with layout designs. Actually, since then, I haven't bothered doing the conversions on later commissions. You may have noticed a couple of my previous designs where I've worked in millimeters. I'm pretty much bilingual when it comes to metric or Imperial measurements. So I've just tended to use whatever my customer gave it to me in. So area A is the main layout room. There's a stairwell at B. C is his workshop, although he did say I could use part of it for staging. Area D, the client thought would be a good site for a helix, although it's actually nowhere near big enough. So he made some alterations to the building later on. And area E was a small tapered space, which I wasn't sure was going to be usable. And to start with, I wasn't even given any dimensions. There's three high level windows along one wall. And this is an archway between the two areas of the building. So with the irregularity of the area, it was always going to be an interesting project to see how I could fit the customer's desires into the space available. As always, I started off by figuring out the best way to wrap the main line around the space. Here's one based on what he gave me. We're keeping an operating aisle around the, the walls, which usually is not the best way of doing it, but this is what he originally asked for, so I wanted to try it anyway. And as we can see, with the radius that we decided would work best, this area is not quite big enough for a helix. Here's another variation going around the walls instead of in the middle of the room. And here's a third version with the middle lobe coming off the other end of the railroad. Now, none of these were coming close to the sort of layout the customer wanted. So we started looking at the possibility of using more of the building. And also the client said that since the builders were still on site, he would move this wall outwards a little bit to make room to put a helix in this area. So here is the site plan for the entire building. We see the roughly octagonal old building the new addition, and where he's bumped the wall out slightly. It was necessary to keep a support column in this location, but I didn't think this would be a problem. I figured I could work my way around it. At least now we have room in this corner for a turn back curve. And he offered to take part of this wall down. Initially, he didn't think that it would be enough to make a difference. But as soon as there's enough room to get one of the end curves outside of the main space, it makes a huge difference. Now you'll notice that I turn the layout on its side in this plan so that it would fit better on the screen. In actual fact, with it this way round, north is almost down. So before I continued, I turn it round another 180 degrees. Now even with the slightly enlarged space, we still had several false starts. Here is plan five, which is the first design where it actually looked like we were starting to get somewhere. And by this point, the customer had revised his want list quite considerably, which is why I didn't go into it at the beginning. But by this time, he decided that he wanted a long double track main line with all the usual common carrier features, freight yard, passenger terminal, engine servicing. He wanted a complex junction with several different routes all coming together in one location. He wanted a sizable steel mill complex and he wanted a significant harbour area. Now you may notice that there is no harbour, I'll show you that in a minute. And although the original plan was to put the helix in this corner, 
we found that by moving it out into the middle of the room at the base of the peninsula, we actually had a lot more running room. And at this point, we thought about the, the idea of a helix viewing window from the stairwell. It just seemed like a natural progression from this plan. The idea was to build it as a triple deck layout with staging on the bottom, most of the operating areas in the middle, and then some mountainous main line on the top deck. Now here's the staging level, and we can see that I moved the harbour down to the lower deck because there wasn't really space for on the top, and I envisaged it being operated from an office chair with the operator sitting directly under the peninsula of the main deck. And then we've got the two staging yards at both ends of the railroad, room for some crossovers between them, and I showed reverse loops under both helixes. So we've got plenty of room for swapping trains around at both ends of the run between sessions, either looping round and round or reversing them to return back from the way they came. And the idea on the upper deck was to make it a twice round loop, ending up in some staging. And this parallelogram in the middle was intended to be a viewing balcony accessible from the mezzanine level. Here was the later development of the upper deck. The main line wraps one and a half times around the room cutting across on a high bridge with full walk under headroom, staging loops underneath the viewing balcony, and to get back down from the skyline to regular upper deck height, it required another two lap helix underneath the upper staging. And all these tracks that run over the top of the aisleways are over 80 inches high, giving full walk under access to even the tallest operators. And then also on the upper deck, we put in a branch line to an iron ore mine. As being a useful addition to the steel mill theme, this part of the railroad representing a mountainous area some distance from the city on the main deck. If we go back to the main deck, we see that we have the steel mill. I assigned part of the peninsula for the coke plant because there just didn't seem to be enough room for it in the steel mill without cramping things. And although this design was fairly well received, there were some problems with it. Firstly, he decided to abandon the viewing balcony. Secondly, he remeasured his addition and found that it wasn't quite as wide as we had drawn it. And although the turnback curves would still just about squeeze in this area, there would be no room for the engine terminal. At first, I suggested moving it to the peninsula where it could share space with the coke plant, because I felt there's probably enough space to squeeze in both. But the other problem was that he didn't like the harbour being on the lower deck. He wanted it moved up to the main deck, where it would be more easily viewed. Clearly something would have to go, because at that point we would be exceeding the confines of the room. And it was suggested that we move this turnback curve into the workshop and put the engine terminal in there with it. So I drew some designs based on that. Here is a rough idea sketch showing how this might work. It shows how much of the workshop is needed to do that. This gap here is a little on the narrow side, requiring the aisle to be reduced in width somewhat. And there will be a fairly narrow aisle along this side between the two doors. But since he has another machine shop elsewhere for his larger power tools, this was basically just going to be a, a model building bench. So there's still plenty of room for him. He decided that this was perfectly satisfactory in the workshop area. Now with this new design, the main line is no longer wrapping around the end of the peninsula, it's just going straight to the helix. And then we'll have a view box down the middle with one side being the harbour and the other side being the coke plant. And they will both be accessible via separate branch lines. And we've got this junction moved to this point opposite the engine terminal. So there'll be four different routes radiating from it in this one direction. There's the two main lines to the lower and upper decks and the two branch lines to the harbour and coke plant. Just ignore this inset drawing here. That is from a previous version that never got developed. And I haven't done any work on the steel mill. This is still only an idea sketch. Here is the northern half of the layout with the track filled in a lot more detail. I really struggled to get all the crossovers and connections necessary around this curve here while still keeping to alignments that would look good under passenger trains. And here we can see 
this complex junction taking shape with the four separate routes radiating from it in this direction. And at the other end, we've got the double track main line going through the, the city and the passenger terminal. We've got a relief line serving as a lead track and accessing the engine terminal. And we've got the freight main diving underneath the engine terminal, coming back out into view again for a few more feet before passing under the front of the passenger terminal to reach the freight yard on the lower level. Here is a view showing more of the layout. I still haven't done the peninsula, although I have filled in the freight yard and shown how we could put a crossing between the main common carrier and the steel railroad to access more mills and warehouses along these two walls, thus helping to visually expand the steel mill well beyond what we actually had room for. And you may also notice that since the main line is no longer wrapping around the peninsula, I shaved it slightly to widen the aisles from 36 inches to 42 inches. And on a multi-deck layout, those extra six inches of aisle do make a big difference. So next I started working on the peninsula and here's what I came up with. The harbour branch follows the aisle closely. Now he wanted a ship canal down through the middle of his harbour instead of having the track along the back with wharfs leading into the foreground. And although this is a little on the narrow side, by carefully choosing fairly small vessels we can actually make it look reasonable. I think it's about 20 inches wide. It still takes up a lot of the harbour area and it puts the track behind it at a fair old stretch. So it's probably going to be necessary to have a step stool available just in case you need to reach in. And I think automatic uncouplers on the back tracks are going to be a must. But despite the compromises, he did say he really liked the way it came out. And then the other branch line feeding the coke and byproducts plants comes off a curved turnout dives across the base of the peninsula behind the helix and comes out through a hill. This area fairly closely follows a track plan for a prototype plant I found in a book on steel mills, although it is somewhat compressed. These three spurs serving the byproducts plant are very much shorter than the ones on the prototype, but they're still long enough to be worthwhile. And there's a small yard in front for coal and coal coppers, not nearly enough to be used as a coal storage yard, but enough to switch a train length cut of cars, so therefore providing the necessary operational flexibility. Now notice how the backdrop down the middle is a double-sided row of building flats, basically allowing both scenes to look deeper than they really are. And since the harbour trackage is a few inches below the coke plant, it's possible for these tracks here extending in the buildings to extend all the way out of the coke plant, giving extra capacity on each one. And then I redrew this, adding a little bit more detail and one extra track going through a warehouse along the back. Now, since I was still researching steel mills at this point, I left the middle deck unfinished and started working on the other levels. Here is the staging deck. Because of the direction of the helix, we had to come off counterclockwise. So instead of going straight to staging, we wrap around the peninsula and run all the way around the edge of the layout until we can get to the staging area. And as a bonus, this gives us about a mile of extra visible mainline running on the lower deck. And since at this point he decided that he wanted it to represent the coast of California, we've already decided that the south staging is going to represent Los Angeles and north staging Sacramento. And I finished this long run here as a coastal line. We see the reversing loop under this south helix. And although originally I put one under this helix as well, I decided it was a lot easier just to rejoin it at this point. Otherwise the curves and grades got a lot sharper than they needed to be. And I have a pair of crossovers between the staging yards and spare locomotive storage. There's also pairs of crossovers at each end for maximum flexibility. Although in this case they are on the visible portion, which is perfectly satisfactory. And because of this column, which was right in the way at this point, I split the main lines and had them going through twin rock tunnels instead of one double track tunnel as I've used in a couple of other places along the coast. And although it came about quite by accident, this area ended up being one of my favourite parts of the design. As shown, we've got room for a couple of large bridges. And in common with many customers I've had, 
this gentleman likes his bridges. So bonus there. So with this completed, I got back to the steel mill and I started working this in. So the freight yard here is not the main yard for the city. It's just a small subsidiary yard handling local freights and the steel interchange. It has yard leads at both ends, although the one at this end also doubles as the branch line to the steel mill. Most of the switching will be taking place from the other end. And then a short distance away, we have another yard owned by the steel company. And in common with many prototype steel mills that I looked at, the steel yard actually has more tracks than the adjacent common carrier yard. And when I started to figure out how those would be used, I came to the conclusion that I needed to squeeze in as many tracks as possible. He's still going to have to think ahead if he's going to be able to get all the operations with this yard at this size. And although it would be totally impossible to represent a full-size steel mill in the confines of a normal size layout, I've done my best to convince the viewer that there's more to it than meets the eye. For example, rolling mills tend to be huge structures, hundreds of feet wide and sometimes up to a mile long. We've just got the corners of a couple of them heading into the background. Even so, there's still many square feet of roof area and it uses up all the areas of the bench work that are basically difficult to reach otherwise. I put in three Walther's blast furnaces, one standard and two kit bashed with an angled end, as seems to be fairly common, and they're all served by the same blower house, which seems to be the norm. I've taken a few things from regular steel mills, for example, the track running through the corner of the blower house, as in Ford's River Rouge mill. I've shown a mirror across the end of this section here before it hits the wall, allowing three blast furnaces to look like six when viewed from certain directions. Now the Walters blast furnace is very much compressed and later we decided that we could use more of the crew lounge for a separate peninsula with a real monster of a blast furnace built full scale size. And then we have open hearth furnaces which are always an interesting structure with their long row of, ch of equally spaced chimneys. Basic auction furnace, another very interesting structure. And the two together basically dates the layout because as basic auction furnaces started to become common, open hearth furnaces were being phased out right around the period that he wanted to represent with the steam to diesel transition era. Now another thing we decided to do with the steel mill is to make it partially a shipyard. You can see here on this mini peninsula, we have the end of a dry dock. Although I drew it watercolor, that was probably an oversight, with a ship under construction. And both the ship and the main buildings here are cut open, allowing all the interior to be seen. We have a second power plant on this peninsula, mainly as an excuse to get another tall chimney right in the middle where it can be used to help support it. He asked for a few changes on the steel mill area. So let's go into those. He liked the idea of the scrap area being alongside a canal with scrap barges in the basin. So I added that area. And he wanted this blast furnace turned around so the high line was on the same side on both of them. I also improved this area, moving the two crossovers further apart to provide a convenient run round. And the twin yard leads at this end were put in mainly for appearance after seeing pictures in books of real steel mills with multiple parallel leads, even though there's only really room for a single operator in this point. So basically only be one switcher at a time. Here is the upper deck plan that I drew. Now note that I didn't take the scenic section into the workshop area. That's because there's a much lower ceiling in that area and he wasn't sure if there'd be enough space. And although this deck may seem fairly chaotic, it's fairly simple to follow. We arrive at the top of the helix, which is double track to avoid congestion, goes to single track as soon as we come out of the tunnel. So this just looks like a passing side and disappearing to the trees here. And then we have this junction here, which I've called toe junction, TOH standing for top of helix. So remember that point because we'll come back to it. We run around the end of the peninsula. There's a small intermediate town with a passing siding. At this point, we're just about high enough for most operators to be able to walk under without stooping. 
follow the front of the bench work, there's the branch line to the ore mine, all the way around, until at this point we're well above head height. Uh, we have a second intermediate town with a long passing track extending down the middle of the peninsula. And we have full walk under clearance, both in this area through the arch and under the high bridge across the aisle. And then this section from the bridge around to what I've called Sky Junction is the highest point of the main line. And the main route goes into staging just above the roof trusses for the workshop, while a continuous cutoff drops down the back, makes a lap underneath the staging yard, runs down the end of the peninsula and comes out of Toe Junction, losing all the height that it gained on the visible lap. And there's room for another long passing siding in that hidden area. Now there were a couple of things that the customer didn't like about this. He wanted me to keep the upper deck out of this room because he wanted plenty of clearance over the top of the blast furnaces. And he felt that this would cramp it somewhat and detract from the appearance of the steel mill. And also this arch here, which as we can see is sandwiched in the middle of the bench work, he wanted to keep that visible because it's a decorative stone arch that he built himself some time ago and he wanted to keep it on display if at all possible. And also at this point, we decided that there was indeed enough clearance to run the upper main line around the workshop and avoid this low area where taller operators would have to stoop. And as a side advantage, we wouldn't have to have this town quite so high requiring such a tall operator platform. Here it is with the modifications although I haven't got the scenery drawn in yet. We can see the main line from the first town taking the longer route through the workshop. And once it gets above the ore mine, instead of coming around over the steel mills, it takes a shortcut over the top of the aisle. There is plenty of clearance at this point because we have a longer grade around through the workshop now. So both the bridges have a full 80 inch or better clearance to walk underneath them. And he felt that being able to look through a truss bridge to his arch was perfectly satisfactory. And then here is the sky staging yard wrapped around the outside of his workshop, just five tracks wide, but each track plenty long enough for two trains. And I don't remember what the elevation was on this staging yard, but it worked out quite well, fitting just under his trusses while still being above the windows and therefore not being in the way. Also on this plan, I showed a possibility of how this branch line could be extended into a minimal staging yard along this wall just above the rolling mills and that would serve to increase the operational flexibility of the branch line. It can now run mixed freight and local passenger trains in addition to the block ore trains. But this is as far as I got on this layout design because at this stage things started to go south in a hurry. He'd been talking about extending this wall to allow for a wider aisle at this point which is why I'm showing the tracks just cutting through the wall because when I drew this, I knew I would have more space here, but I didn't know how much. Anyway, when he gave me the dimensions for this alcove, I tried incorporating them into the plan and the numbers just didn't seem to be working. So he gave me a whole load more dimensions to specify, plotting it at numerous points. And I superimposed it on this wall and discovered that this dimension along here, where the passenger terminal is on the main deck, was not right. And then we looked into it further and we discovered that the entire room was around two feet smaller in both directions than the dimensions he originally gave me. Now how this happened I don't know. Now since the building was still under construction while I was working on the designs, maybe somebody measured the foundations before the walls were built. I don't know. That's only a guess, that's all I can think of. That would certainly be an error of about the size that we ended up with. So at this point, it looked as though I was gonna to have to redesign the layout, squeezing everything down a bit. And we talked about how best to do that. We were thinking that reducing the number of tracks in the freight and passenger areas, shaving a few inches off the curve radius, shaving a few inches off the aisles, we might still be able to get basically the same layout in the smaller space. But before he was even able to get me the revised dimensions, another bombshell hit us and we lost the use of the workshop altogether. 
the customer's mother-in-law was going to be staying with them long term and the workshop was being converted into a bedroom for her. Now we didn't know how long this arrangement was going to last and at first I suggested start with the staging areas, build the steel mill, the freight yard, the passenger terminal and put a temporary turn back curb in at this point, figuring that that would take him years to build and more than likely he would be able to have his workshop back by this stage. But he didn't want to take a chance on that. So we decided to see what we could do in the smaller room. But that was still many months ago. And last time I'd heard from his client, he seemed to be too involved in other things and losing interest in what would have been a lifetime project. Now, I don't know whether I'm ever going to hear from him again. Maybe I'll get the opportunity to design a more modest layout for him. But for the time being, that is the end of this design process. So as I said at the beginning, although it didn't work out quite the way it was planned, I think there is still enough to be learned from this layout design to be worth making this video. So that's why I've done it. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and that you found it interesting or useful, or ideally both. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons, and I will see you again next week. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.